hotel was originally built in 1852 by the Faucher family, a family of Swiss immigrants. Louis Faucher arrived here uh, right around that time, known for being the master chef at Delmonico's in New York City. Louis Faucher was also known for changing the habits of diners in New York City and then up here by offering a menu actually a choice for diners, where it used to be in the 1840s and 1850s with no refrigeration. You basically went into any restaurant and we were serving chicken and potatoes that day, that's what you got. The hotel was originally called the French Hotel. Originally the French who took care of the banking industry in New York at the time, this was their place where they came throughout the late 1800s. The hotel was originally a smaller building once the success of it was starting to really get going, they ended up moving the smaller building to the back of the property and built the current structure that we have here today in 1880. The hotel flourished for a total of 125 years. The hotel has hosted presidents, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Bill Clinton, John F. Kennedy, at Gray Towers, one of his last uh, public appearances, one of his last public speeches was the opening of Gray Towers Memorial. That was late October of 1963. In the dining room that was sitting in here in the very early 1900s, uh, before, right during his presidency, Teddy Roosevelt and uh, Gifford Pinchot, the governor of Pennsylvania at the time, mapped out the plans for the national park system of the United States in this dining room here. Most of the people that you see on the walls on our Hall of Fame, the vaudeville people and uh, movie stars who became movie stars afterwards, uh, were starting their careers in vaudeville and they were the guests here, Rudolph Valentino, Robert Young, uh, Mae West, right along the line, a lot of the famous film producers, D.W. Griffith, uh, Charlie Chaplin had stayed here. Babe Ruth stayed here at the hotel, uh, Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, uh, Ogden Nash, the poet has been here. All these folks have come through Milford and stopped here at the Hotel Faucher. A lot of the famous architects that did major buildings in New York City started their careers by doing homes here in Milford, in the historic district here in Milford. Uh, like really building like the Woolworth building, the lobbies of the Chrysler building, things like that, were designed by people who built homes here in Milford prior to them moving on to much bigger and grander things. The Roebling Bridge right up the river from us here was uh, a bridge that was built by John Roebling before he did the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, it was his first suspension bridge that he had done here. Uh, when Louis Faucher passed away in 1893, uh, the mantle of management was passed on to his daughter, and the family continued to run the hotel and the restaurant until the 1970s. Uh, the hotel then fell into disrepair. It was used as office space, and basically they, they just let it go at that point in time. Uh, early 2001 or 2002, Sean Strube and Dick Snyder purchased the hotel. Uh, and renovated it to, to bring it back to its original glory uh, painstakingly. I, I happened to know them as they were doing it and it never ended. It, it was uh, just a swarm of contractors and inspectors and ARB people, the Architectural Review Board people in here, uh, and they brought all of it back as best they could to its original glory. Uh, Sean operated the hotel until 2021. In 2021, uh, Sean Strube sold, sold the hotel to the Milford Hospitality Group, and we've maintained our same level of excellence that we had prior to that. Uh, elegant dining in the Delmonico room, porch dining, and of course, a little more casual is Bar Louie downstairs. Locals and visitors alike come here to the hotel on a regular basis. We have people, a lot of people from New York, a lot of Philadelphia people, and international travelers. Uh, some of the people that I've met over the years, they, they've been from China, from England, from Australia, from all these places. It was very surprising how all these people ended up here in Milford and not just will come once, they will return back here again uh, because they know what they're going to get when they get here, the kind of service and the kind of rooms and all of the facilities here. Uh, a lot of people visit the area here to take advantage of the proximity to the Delaware River and also to all the hiking trails that are available in the national forests that are around. 
Pike County is some 60% open spaces, so there are just plenty of national forests, state forests, state game lands, access to the river at many different points with canoe rentals and tubing and it's the bike riding, riding the trails, the mountain bike riding trails and the hiking trails and all the things of that nature. You know, people come and they take full advantage of that. And then they come back to a very elegant room and a, a really nice meal, brunch on Sunday morning outside, and then they'll head back to their lives after that. But this has always been a nice respite for anybody who wanted to get away and do things like that. And close to New York City, it's 61 miles and you're back on the west side of Manhattan from here. A lot, a lot of people come to the hotel to see uh, the pictures that are downstairs. Uh, Chris Makos was Andy Warhol's photographer and sidekick for probably about 20 years. And he has photos of many, 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 many people and events. Uh, the John Lennon and Andy Warhol photo behind the bar is fairly iconic. There are only three of those. Uh, we have one. So if you're passing through Milford or want to come to a really very nice place and have a, just a, a lot of activities around in the area here, indoor and outdoor, we have the Readers and Writers Festival, Black Bear Film Festival, our music festival, uh, Toast to Milford, Taste of Milford. You know, we do ladies night out where the businesses all stay open much later than they usually would and everybody comes out and they shop and then they come for cocktails and dinner afterwards here and that's usually a pretty fun evening when, when that's going on. The Hotel Faucher is a destination hotel. People come here just to enjoy all the amenities that we have here and the elegance of the building and the surrounding areas here and all the activities that are the festivals that run throughout the course of the year. But it is, it's a destination hotel. And so once people come here, quite often you see people back year after year after year after year return here to the Hotel Faucher. It's a very open, very friendly place. Come by, 401 Broad Street, Milford, Pennsylvania. Good meal, good food, good hospitality. And come visit with us and we'll take good care of you when you get here. This year's Delaware River Sojourn is taking place June 17th through the 25th. Paddling, great food, camping, educational programs, and entertainment. All you'll need to bring is a tent and any other camping gear you'd like. If camping isn't your style, stay at one of the many bed and breakfasts along the way. Your kayak, life jacket, paddle, and most of your meals are included for one daily rate. For more information, visit DelawareRiverSojourn.com. Everyone is welcome, and we'll see you on the river or the largest selection of first quality remnant carpeting for every room in your home, choose Mike's Walk-In Carpet, the only remnant stocking dealer in Wayne County with high quality carpet purchased directly from the manufacturer. With over 40 years experience, you'll get professional service every time. Don't settle for lesser quality carpeting from the big box stores. Choose the best, remnants or special order from Mike's Walk-In Carpet on Route 590, Hawley. and legend blend together in our historic lake region nowhere more so than at the base of the lake itself. Let's explore the story of Wilsonville and see if we can reconstruct the town under the lake. Hello, my name is uh, Peter Becker and I'm the uh, Wayne County, Pennsylvania historian as well as the uh, managing editor of the News Eagle newspaper in Holly. And I've done a lot of uh, writing of local history topics over the years and uh, I've had quite an interest in this amazing little village that many people have hardly heard of called Wilsonville. People who come to Lake Wallenpawpack today, they enjoy the lake up by the dam, they enjoy the dam and they never know that what they're looking at was the site of a once prosperous industrial village. 
What is now the lake started out as a river going through the valley. It ended at the, in a great waterfall that was 70 feet high. The falls cascaded approximately three miles heading towards what would become Holly. It was a very lush valley with a tall white pine and tall conifers, giant trees. As the Native Americans were well aware of the beauty of the Wallenpapak River and its uh, slow and moving waters, which is where the name Wallenpapak came from. It all started way back in the 1700s. White colonists came along. They saw a good chance here for profit because they immediately saw those falls as a very potential source for uh, hydropower to run mills. This theme would last up to this present day. Judge James Wilson, a founding father of the United States of America, uh, he was a Scottish uh, immigrant who became a lawyer down in Philadelphia. He was a fierce uh, advocate for independence and became one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. After the war was settled, President Washington named him to the first United States Supreme Court. And when the, he retired, he came up and he had purchased a vast territory in northeast Pennsylvania called the Wallenpapak Manor. It was 12,500 acres and included what would be Wilsonville. In the late 1830s, early 1840s, William Schaus purchased the land at the top of the, the falls, which by now had been drained and there was actually land that you could build there. And he built a very successful lumber mill. And, and Schaus did a very good business there. He was a very smart businessman, but he also sort of recognized that he was getting older and he sold out to Farnham and Collingwood, which was a partnership of a guy from Honesdale, Farnham, and a guy from New York City, uh, Collingwood. Farnham and Collingwood did a very good business again because there was strong demand until President Grant, he made the move to take the country's currency off the silver standard. Well, if there's no need for silver, the silver market crashes. If there's silver market that crashes, the little towns dry up. If the little towns dry up, there's no reason to have a railroad spur there, and suddenly the railroad companies, which had done a huge amount of investment in the West in new rail tracks and spur lines and so forth, found themselves overextended, and they went bankrupt like dominoes. And so that crash started the Great Depression of 1873, which was the largest depression felt in the United States at the time. It was devastating. And among other things, it reduced the market for lumber to the point where Farnham and Collingwood's once thriving sawmill became essentially worthless. And they both lost their shirts. That was the beginning of the end of Wilsonville. No longer a working sawmill, no longer having much income, became just another sleepy little spot along a road between here and there. In 1895, the, there were a group of investors from Philadelphia who recognized the value of the Wall and Paw Pack as a water power site. And they purchased the Schaus and Farnham and Collingwood site that was at the head of the falls. They filed a plan with the State Water Power Commission to form a 5,577 and a half acre lake, which is very close to the size of the modern Lake Wall and Paw Pack. So that project failed. Then along came Colonel Watrous, who was an industrialist from Scranton, which leaves us at about 1914, when that project fell apart because the war in Europe made the entire economy uh, turn down, and he couldn't build the electric railroad across the Pocono Plateau, which is what he intended to use the electricity for. And so the project went begging for a buyer until about 1922 when Pennsylvania Power and Light, which had recently formed in uh, Allentown, was looking for sources for electricity, they finally bought the project, lock, stock, and barrel. Along the lines of things that are uh, made possible by modern technology, side scan sonar is one of the things that allows people to do archeology span that was not possible before. Sonar uses sound waves that are transmitted from a particular device and then bounce off things that are distant from them and then are received back. As uh, the bottom contours change and as the type of bottom, mud, rock, whatever, change, you get back varying intensities of the sound and that allows you to paint an image of what's on the bottom. 
Now, it's not an optical image, it's actually just a sound image. So something that looks bright in a sonar image is probably something that's hard, like a rock, which may or may not be actually bright when you look at it with light. And in fact, depending on what the silt and the bottom is like, it's possible to look at things that are under the bottom, things that have been covered up by silt, that wouldn't be visible at all if you drained the lake and went to look at them. The sonar images really do show us what's underneath the lake. So this is an image of the bridge across the wall in Pawpack. As you look at it, from the right is upstream, the left is downstream. Uh, and you can see the Pike County side is at the top and the Wayne County side at the bottom. And at the very bottom of that image, you can see some of the buildings that are there at that intersection in the middle of, of what we would call Wilsonville. This is another view of the dam, the large center supports. Those little dots are actually supports that they added when they increased the size of the, the bridge to accommodate the heavy construction vehicles. This is actually a sonar image of what you could consider downtown Wilsonville. The various little bright areas are stone walls that form the foundations of the buildings. And if you compare that to the pictures or the maps, you can actually make sense of what's there. To about a third of the way down, you see the road to the west and the foundation of the White House is just to the right, about midway up the page. One of the reasons to go back and revisit history is that we're always finding new things. There can be new physical evidence, there can be documentary evidence, and especially as the internet has, has taken hold of things, it's much, much easier to do research now than it was in the past. I'm Lorraine Collins, President of Davis R. Chant Realtors. And I'm Abby Pittendra-Claus, Vice President of Davis R. Chant Realtors. Chant has been serving the Lake Wall and Pawpack region for over 58 years, and we are proud to say we sell more homes by volume than any other real estate company in Northeast Pennsylvania. We are coming off our strongest year in the Lake Region real estate market, selling over $430 million in sales volume. We work with sellers to put together a thoughtful but aggressive marketing plan tailored to each home individually. Each of our property listings gets a virtual tour and is professionally photographed, giving the prospective buyer the best first impression. The Lake Wall and Popeck area is an attractive place to live because of its low taxes, great school districts, and beautiful scenery. Our team of agents here at Davis Archant Realtors has extensive knowledge in the local real estate market. We have experience with everyone from first-time home buyers to experienced investors. Chant uses a variety of print media, billboards, open houses, and national real estate websites to promote properties and reach potential buyers. Here at Chant, we know that working together and providing channels of communication and feedback is important for the best outcome when selling your home. If you are ready to relocate, upgrade, downsize, or know anyone who's considering the Lake Region area, please stop by one of our CHAN offices or call us at 570-226-4518 or visit us online at chantre.com. The Sterling Business and Technology Park is currently divided into 23 lots ranging in size from 3 to 30 acres. Each lot in the park is KOZ certified for companies that qualify. The Sterling Business and Technology Park is perfectly located just off exit 17 on Interstate 84 in northeastern Pennsylvania, just under two hours from New York City. If you would like to explore locating your business at Sterling Business and Technology Park, visit sterlingbusinesspark.com. Since 1962, Lake Wall and Paul Pack Scenic Boat Tours has offered guests the opportunity to sit back, relax, and enjoy a breathtaking cruise detailing the area and the history of the region. For those who want to be their own captain, Lake Wall and Pawpat Scenic Boat Tours offers a variety of services, including pontoon boat, kayak, and paddleboard rentals. Lake Wall and Pawpat Boat Tours and Rentals have everything you'll need for a day on the water. For more information, visit them at East Shore Lodging, 2487 Route 6 in Holland, or online at wallandpawpatboattour.com.
For more information, visit wallandpawpackboattour.com or call 570-226-3293. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and many other social media platforms. We are always looking for new and unusual story ideas, interesting people, and unique events. Send your ideas for the show to Troy at WallyLife.com. If you're a business looking to reach the Northeastern Pennsylvania market using the most powerful media platform available, contact Emily Grillo. At Bold Gold Media, eGorillo at boldgoldmedia.com or call 570-253-1616. The Dorflinger Sudum Wildlife Sanctuary features over 600 acres with five miles of pristine historic walking trails, a natural amphitheater, a small lake, the Dorflinger Glass Museum, and a gift shop. Christian Dorflinger and his factory in White Mills created some of the most beautiful cut glass in the world. The glass Museum and the Wildlife Sanctuary are actually part of a property, or on the property, that was purchased in 1862 by Christian Dorflinger, who was a glassmaker making glass in factories in Brooklyn, New York. Dorflinger moved here with his family, built the factory here, houses for workers, brought workers here, sold off his interests in Brooklyn. And this became the base of operation from the 1860s up until the time the factory closed in 1919, 1921. By 1861, he had produced a set of glassware for the White House for the President and Mrs. Lincoln. So that had kind of established him his, and his reputation for making fine glassware. Fred and Dorothy Sudam took over this property in the 1920s and it was kind of a second home for them and they uh, made modifications to the old farmhouse. Dorothy Sudam gifted the property to the community and the wildlife sanctuary was established. The Dorflinger Glass Museum was added a few years later and the natural amphitheater became the home of the Wildflower Music Festival. We have the Wildflower Music Festival in the summers and we have about seven or eight concerts every summer in our natural outdoor amphitheater. It is a stunning, beautiful, natural place to come among the giant pines and bring your picnic dinner. The uh, performances are, uh, I mean, just incredible. I mean, the, the space is, is just a beautiful setting. And sometimes you see, actually, I've seen rabbits across the stage in the middle of a performance, or deer come up to the edge of the side of the stage, and um, it's just a beautiful setting. Over the years, the Wildflower Music Festival has attracted well-known performers. In addition to the amphitheater, the sanctuary offers many of its outdoor and indoor spaces for rent. The grounds are available for rental. We have the Blau Building, we have the Natural Amphitheater, and we have some large, flat, grassy areas next to the pond that are just stunning. The Blau Building could be used for corporate meetings, for small parties, showers, small occasions such as that, with plenty of parking and handicapped facilities. We have the amphitheater, which could be rented for musical endeavors. It's available for weddings. It would be a gorgeous location for a wedding. The flat area next to the pond is just gorgeous, and that could be used for an outdoor dinner party. The best way to experience the beauty of this property is to walk through the grounds and see everything the property has to offer. The 600 acres is just incredibly beautiful and there are just things around every turn on every trail. Um, if you just do the trail around the lake, which is an easy half mile walk, there are views of the, the original farmhouse, there are views in the woods, there are ponds that were put in for waterfowl. It's just, it's just an incredibly peaceful and calming spot. And so that's just the outside. Um, if you decide to come into the glass museum, you see this incredibly beautiful glass made by some of the most talented glass artists in, the, in history, really, um, who were just ordinary people who, with this incredible skill set, making these beautiful 
pieces that we look at today. The Glass Museum, festivals, and wildlife sanctuary rely on the support of members and volunteers. We could use new members, we could use new uh, volunteers. Volunteers help us in the museum and in the gift shop. And it's a great chance to come out and see this natural, beautiful gem that we have here in White Mills. The Dorflinger Sudum Wildlife Sanctuary needs your support. Consider becoming a member. If you'd like to learn more about Dorflinger and you can't just stop by, you should go to our website, which is dorflinger.org. You can also call us at 570-253-1185. Tune in to Wally Life every Monday at 9 p.m. on Blue Ridge Communications Channel 13 for the latest in life around Lake Wallenpaupack.